and welcome to the Rooted in Podcast, hosted by Rooted in Language. We share expert guidance on teaching language arts and literacy based on the science of reading, best teaching practices, and our decades of experience. I am Rita Savasco, and I'm a speech and language pathologist. I teach students to read, write, and spell, especially those who struggle. Today, I'm going to talk about the relationship between our oral language skills and our literacy skills. If you've been following Rooted in Language, you know that we often quote Virginia Berninger when she talks about how we have language by mouth, which is speaking, and language by ear, which is listening, and language by eye, which is reading, and language by hand, which is writing. And the reason Berninger came up with this metaphor is because we know the left hemisphere of the brain houses all of our language skills. And we also know that our speaking listening skills develop right away in our development. In fact, they start developing even in utero and that reading and writing skills tend to emerge Uh, With explicit instruction, we learn to become readers and writers around the age of five or six. But we know that the areas of the left hemisphere that are used for listening and speaking are repurposed and expanded upon when we learn to read and write. So we're using some of the same processes. So This is important because whenever we're talking about listening, speaking, reading, and writing, even for someone like myself, who's a speech and language therapist, it's very easy to confuse what we're really testing for, what we're really working on, and how we should help children advance their skills in each of these areas. So I mentioned that even before birth, our oral language skills are underway. The development of our oral language skills are underway. And this is because there is research done on babies in utero, and we know that they can hear, they can hear their mother's voice. We know upon birth, new babies already will orient to their mother's voice in a way they don't orient to other voices because they've been hearing this voice even before they were born. And researchers also know that babies begin to attend to the speech of their home language in a way that's different for how they attend to speech in any language. So initially a new baby may attend to all spoken languages the same, but over time, babies will attend to their home language in a way that they don't attend to other languages. And this is important. We are listeners who through listening, we begin to engage in sound play and then through conversation, through exposure to our language, we become much more proficient in the speech sounds of our own language, not only in how well we speak them, but in how well we process them, how much we attend to them. So we hear all this sound and we begin to pick out what's important. And in fact, this ability to kind of chunk information or segment information is part of the way that researchers think that children begin to pick words out of a stream of talking so that they begin to develop words. So in other words, I might have a mom who talked to me all day long and said all kinds of things to me, but my ability to segment, to recognize these segmental aspects of what she said helped me separate from this stream of sound what words were. And then I began to imitate those words and use those words and my language skill is developing. So if you think about it, in terms of our oral language skills, we have a new talker whose maybe first couple words includes the words mama, mama. 
And in fact, we know that this new baby saying, the new toddler maybe, saying mama is initially engaging in just sound play. So you might get this mama, 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 this babbling. But one day this becomes mama. That means this person who means the world to me. Okay. And then mama may become mommy. So we have mama and this progresses to mommy. And then the child grows and pretty soon they know mom. So we have mama, mommy, and mom. But to a speaker, those words are all the same. They're one solid word and they represent a person whom I love. Mama, mommy, mom. And then young children begin to acquire what language therapists call grammatical morphemes so that we begin to add grammar aspects to our sentences. So all of a sudden, I could say moms. And moms might mean more than one mom. There are lots of moms at this party. Or moms might be a contracted form for a third person singular. Moms sitting over there. Okay. Or moms pretty. Moms smart. Or moms could mean mom's hat. Okay. So by the time I'm five, I have most of these grammatical structures that I need in my oral language. And I can pick out these grammatical structures, but I don't have any idea how to read them or how to write them. I have no idea that the word mom, which can also be said mommy, that mommy would be spelled with a double M before this Y. I just know that the word mom and mommy is a single word. And I know that when I say moms, it could mean a plural. Or if I hear moms here, if someone says to me, mom's here, mom's in the driveway, mom's at the door, I know that this has to do with mom's location and that I'm linking mom to this location. And if I say mom's hat, I know this means this hat belongs to mom. All of these grammatical structures I can use around the age of five before I begin to read and write. But I have no idea what they look like. I only know what they sound like and I know how to use them in sentences and I know their meaning. I know a lot more as a five-year-old, but I'm just focusing on these examples. So the baby cognitively has phonological processing skills that the baby uses for speech and listening. And the baby has phonology skills, sound skills that they use for making speech sounds. And those speech sounds come together for word recognition. And the five-year-old has likely mastered almost all of these speech sounds and uh, is well understood by others. And also the baby is picking out words and the meaning and the five-year-old has this well-developed semantic system and cognitively we call it their semantics system where they have a great deal of content that they understand. They understand vocabulary and they've had five years worth of developing background knowledge about their world. And then this baby begins with single word sentences, quickly going to two word sentences, quickly going to three, four, five, six, seven word sentences, et cetera. And the five-year-old is using this robust syntactic system, the syntax of the language to create sentences, okay? And this is all in terms of speaking and listening. And so when we think about what happens in school, 
in the oral language environment, what we're doing is we're really orally increasing vocabulary. We're building into students' vocabulary systems. We're building into their concept development. And we're building into collecting more and more background knowledge. So for the listening speaking system, a lot goes on once children begin learning to read and write, even though it's separate from the reading and writing. So if I continue to read aloud to students and I continue to teach on concepts and we go on field trips and we have big experiences and we do science projects, I'm building into vocabulary, concepts, background knowledge. That's what's going on in the oral language system. So now let's layer in the listening speaking, the literacy learning that takes place around the age of five. So suddenly everything's changed. I've come to school having already a, a strong attention for all of my home language. I may be a dual language learner, so I may have attention for more than one language. I have understanding and usage of that language. And I comprehend what I hear in stories and in conversations. I understand how to engage in conversation. I know a lot about my language. And so what happens is I'm beginning now to learn that I needed to be paying attention to books. And I may have some pre-literacy skills. I may have a sense of what words are. I might understand that words occur in a book. I might understand that they represent what I hear, the same thing every time. I may know the names of my letters. I might know how to write my name and I know what names do. I might be able to read signs. But I now have to learn that a word like mom is made up of three sounds, m, mm, ah, m. Mm. And I see that these letters represent those sounds and that I can hear those sounds and write those letters, and I can see this string of letters, and I can blend those sounds together to read a word. And I also begin to learn that mom, when combined with something called a suffix, y, creates the word mommy. And I'm even learning that there's this doubling rule. I have to double the m before I add the y, mommy. And I also learn that if I say my mom's cat is old, or if I write my mom's cat is old, I now understand that a possessive has an apostrophe S. And if I want to write the sentence mom's smart, I know that that is the sentence mom is smart and that I can create a contraction mom apostrophe S that means mom is. And all these things are being layered on top of my oral language system. But I just don't start there. I actually need some time to go from the mm, ah, mm, makes mom, to get to the point of mom plus y equals double m mommy. I have to learn a lot before I'm able to write those sentences and spell them and create contractions and create possessives. All of that takes some time. And this tends to take about three years time. And then once I start to become proficient in reading and writing, there is a lot of kind of self-learning that also happens as I engage with text and I'm learning an average about 1,500 new words a year. So this is what's going on in terms of the literacy system. So we take something like sound in the baby, and it becomes phonics and phonology and phonological processing in order to learn reading and writing. And I take something like, I see letters I know, and all of a sudden I'm needing to learn spelling and spelling patterns called orthography. And I take these grammatical morphemes that I knew in order to combine sentences, and all of a sudden, I have the morphology of the way words work, how we tie these prefixes, base words, and suffixes, and how that ties to grammar. 
my oral syntax, how I put sentences together, now becomes written grammar rules that I need to learn and expand upon. And these words that I knew, my semantic system, teachers are now calling my vocabulary. And all of that learning begins to grow and grow and grow until our literacy skills not only meet our oral language skills over the years, but may begin to surpass our oral language skills. In other words, I may become an adult who writes at a more formal level than I actually speak or who comprehends vocabulary, more vocabulary than what I actually use in my everyday conversation. And I may be able to read advanced texts that actually I'm now gaining vocabulary and gaining background knowledge, not just through listening and speaking, but through reading and writing. The brand new reader and writer has a lot to learn. They have a lot to juggle. They have to coordinate phonics and punctuation and new grammar skills, written grammar skills, and their vocabulary with spelling. And they have to be monitoring, comprehending what they write, organizing when they write, comprehending what they read, understanding the organization of books. They have to bring short-term and long-term memory to the task. They have to understand what to attend to and what not to attend to, what are main ideas, what are details. They have to somehow become fluent in their reading and writing. They have so many things that they have to be doing and they can't learn it all at once. We have to break it down and make it easy the way we make any task easy. So we have this saying, uh, here at Rooted in Language, that no one learns to swim by drowning. So if you think about this progression of this baby to five-year-old to 10-year-old that I've been talking about, you would never take a baby and teach them how to swim by tossing them off a diving board. In fact, I can barely say that without just cringing, right? We wouldn't just put a baby in water by themselves. We understand that children need time to learn how to swim. And even a five-year-old who maybe only has had some experience in water of taking a bath or being in a shallow baby pool, we wouldn't take a five-year-old and say, here, jump off this diving board so you can learn how to swim. Instead, we break up skills. We take them slowly. We teach kids how to put their face in the water and how to blow bubbles. And we teach kids how to kick their legs. And we teach them what it means to tread water and what it means to move arms and legs together. And then what it means to coordinate moving arms and legs with breathing. And then when they can support themselves and make motion across the pool, we say, now you can go off a diving board, but I'll still be here to help you. I might be here to help catch you. I might be here to swim with you from the middle of the pool to the end so you feel safe and you know that you'll have help if you need it. This is the way we teach all kinds of complex skills. We teach math skills by starting at the beginning of what is a number and what does that number represent and how can we build numbers? We don't start at this really high level. However, we've somehow mixed up this oral language system with literacy so that we often forget that one skill is not the same as the other. We might look at an early reader and say, well, that book's boring. My child has way more vocabulary than that. My child can do so much more than that in their oral language skills. Why are we reading these silly little books that only have a few words? Because literacy skills aren't oral language skills. They're built on oral language skills. They connect to oral language skills, 
But having a child start reading by starting with complex text is the equivalent of taking a five-year-old who doesn't know how to swim and pushing them off a diving board. Their only choices are to flounder around. As opposed to, I've learned some real skills over here in the shallow water where life is a little simpler, things are easier, they're more manageable, and now I gain skills and I gain skills and I gain skills, and now I'm just beginning to get to this point where it's starting to approach the oral language skills, where I'm approaching this ability to have the kind of independence I need to dive off that big diving board and swim to the edge. And now pretty soon, man, I'm like rocking it in the pool. I know what I'm doing and I'm practicing all kinds of things and I don't need to be taught every little thing I learn. I'm swimming all around. I'm making my own kind of fun and I'm independent now in the pool. The young reader has so much to juggle and needs time to learn. The young reader needs time for meaningful practice at a level they can manage and success at each level so that they can have independence and continue to progress to the next level. So for example, in our pinwheels program, our very, very first readers have very few words on them. And they don't have all the grammatical structures that your child might know in their oral language because what they're working on is reading, not talking, not listening. And they're working on writing. These are hard skills and they're, they're complex. They have a lot of small skills that have to work together in order for that to happen. And so we want meaningful practice that they're successful at so they can have independence. And so by the end of Pinwheels year one, we have full sentences that have more grammatical structures and might have four to six words in the sentence as opposed to two words in a sentence. And by Pinwheels year two, we may have pages of text that have two or three sentences, but it progresses to pages of text with say five or six sentences or with more two syllable words. And this is the way reading and writing is most successfully taught. We want accuracy. We want independent skills. And we're not holding kids back from their oral language. We're getting them to their oral language. That's the goal. Eventually we know the more independent kids become, the more they actually will grow their oral language through reading and writing. The number one way we improve vocabulary is through reading. That's our biggest source for mining vocabulary and growing our vocabularies. And it becomes the way we build background knowledge. We're not just relying on conversations anymore, although that's great. Conversations are great and need to continue. And we're not just relying on what we can say or what we can hear, although all of that is so important. And we're not just relying on being read to or listening to audiobooks, although those are rich but we now add even more to our oral language system through reading and writing, and that takes time. When I said it's easy to confuse all of these systems of language, I mean that with respect, because I can do it too. I'll want kids to engage in a reading comprehension task but I've maybe given so much conversation and read aloud time that what they understood in their reading comprehension has been supported, but I don't really know what they would have understood on their own if they had read the entire thing. So it's important to know what our goals are. If my goal is to prep you well 
for the topic you're going to read about, then absolutely doing some read alouds around that topic to build your background knowledge and engaging in conversation and teaching you some of the vocabulary involved. That's a great way to build into your reading comprehension. But then reading on your own is how I know how strong your reading comprehension is. And it's important to keep in mind, what am I doing and how? Am I supporting and building? And am I periodically pulling back to see what you can do on your own? These are the ways that we need to really understand what's going on. And we should not be afraid of treating reading and writing like any brand new skill, like learning to swim. It's not hurting the oral language system to take our time with learning, reading, and writing. We're building into the kind of success and independence that will eventually feed and grow our oral language system. But we do still want to have rich conversations and read aloud to kids and let them listen to audiobooks because the oral language system is important. And the more vocabulary and background knowledge we have, the better our reading comprehension will be down the road. So they overlap. Of course, they overlap. This is language by mouth speaking, language by ear listening, language by eye reading, and language by hand writing. They're all the same language system. But one, listening, speaking, we start developing before we're born. And the other, reading and writing, we have to learn explicitly and then implicitly around the age of five and six. This is Rooted in Language. As always, we appreciate your listening. When you like our podcasts, blogs, recordings, or reels, and when you share them with your friends, you help others find this critical information. So be sure to follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, and visit our website, rootedinlanguage.com. There you'll find our classes, curricula, instructional materials, and plenty of free resources. Support our mission to help all learners become the best readers and writers they can be, including your own kids.